Our Father and God, we're grateful for this time to consider uh, the Hebrew text again. We thank you for uh, what we've been able to consider thus far, for uh, your word, which you've preserved for us in a language we can understand and know. We thank you for revealing yourself to us, for not leaving us in darkness. We pray that you would bless our time together and pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Okay, so this morning... We're going to consider weak verbs. Weak verbs uh, have to do with the presence of special consonants within uh, the ground form of the verb. And this looks like uh, several different things. We have what's called hollow verbs, which is where there's a, a... a vav standing as a shurek or a holum in the middle of the verb. You have verbs that have a hey at the end of them. You have verbs that have a yud or a nun at the beginning of them. And so there's, there's several different uh, forms of, of weak verbs. And we call them weak verbs because consonants are so prone to disappearing that they're, that they're labeled weak consonants. They don't stand up well to the presence of a preformative or an afformative. And so these are known as weak verbs. They're constantly losing their consonants. And if you have the Van Pelt Compact Guide with you, uh, if you begin on page 154 of that and look through, there are several different paradigms where they give you all of the verbal stems that we've looked at, the cow, the nifal, the hifil, hafal, pl, puau, hit pile. They give you the, the stems there and they show you how different kinds of weak verbs are inflected. They show you what happens when you've got a guttural in the middle, when you've got a shurek or a full holum in the middle, when you've got a final hay. Um, you'll see some of them have little dashes uh, a one, Roman numeral one, and then a guttural. That's showing you there's a, there's a guttural in the first position of the ground form consonants. It's the first consonant is a guttural. Then there's a chart when there's middle consonants, a guttural, and then when the final consonants, a guttural, so on and so forth. So that's very helpful. I would refer you to that because what we're going to do briefly today is we're not going to consider all the paradigms. I thought about doing print printouts and handing some of those out. Y'all would get a stack of papers. We're just going to consider uh, for our purposes some brief considerations of uh, weak verbs because there's several different kinds of weak verbs. I counted uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That was going to be a whole mess of paradigms. I didn't want to drag all that out. So I'm going to cram all of it in the lesson today. Just give you some brief pointers that I think will be relevant to your studies. Um, first of all, I'm not aware of, I don't have the knowledge to pass on to you, all the different ways that these verbs are conjugated. Um, I've not run into them, all of them in my translation exercises. So we're just going to consider some brief um, brief things today. We're going to begin with the form of a weak verb that's called a hollow verb. Okay, hollow verb. And a hollow verb is a verb that has a full holum or a shurek in the middle. The second ground form consonant. Okay, so it's a vav the consonant vav appearing as a vowel. So it is a vowel and a consonant kind of at the same time. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But the, the, the hollow verb is going to have in the middle, we'll put it in the easiest terms possible, in the middle or second ground form consonant. Now, When I say second ground form consonant, this is this is going to be the lexical form. And we'll throw a monkey wrench into it, but it's not the third masculine singular form. We'll we'll look at look at that in in just a little bit too. What are some examples of some hollow verbs? I'm going to take my notebook with me. 
lest I forget. Well, we have one, and this is your vocabulary too, so if you want to go ahead and write these down. One is shuv. Shuv. You know, there's no, notice there's no consonants underneath. No consonants, no shavas. And this word means to turn back. To turn back, go back. A is trying to turn into a Q there. To turn back, to go back. And I think of, you know, when you shove somebody, you're turning them back. You're pushing them back. So that was an easy, easy word for me to remember. If you just think of shoving somebody, shove to turn back. Another example would be um, bow. We, we've already looked at. Y'all remember bow uh, was to go in, to come in. Pretty common word. That's a, that's a very interesting, one of the most interesting verbs. You've got a begad kafat, you've got a hollow verb, and you've got a guttural at the end. So that's, that can be inflected all kinds of ways. But this is... Uh, to go in, we'll just say. But there's another example of a hollow verb. And then another one is moot. And this one means to die. You remember um, ca- the uh, katal was to kill, this one's to, to die, more of a, a passive. And the, the ground form, or, or the, the lexical form of these verbs is this with the three ground form consonants. There's also a noun that corresponds to some of these. For instance, mavet is noun it means death. So instead of a verb, you see the forms look similar. It's all the same consonants, but you have it in the uh, verb form. You have the, sh- the vav appearing as a shurek, the vowel. Here it appears as a consonant. You know it's a consonant because it has a vowel underneath it. A full olam or a shurek wouldn't have a segol underneath it. That would be impronounceable in Hebrew. So, some forms are similar, but that's a a hollow verb. Uh, Sometimes you'll also see a hollow verb with a yud in the middle. I tend to think of them more as holams or shurex, but you will see some people refer to... That's a seen, not a sheen. The word seem, that's to put or to place. Getting a little bit crowded up here. But some people will call that a hollow verb too. Now, when you start adding um, affirmatives and, and preformatives, the, the, the vowel in here is a strong vowel, but it is forced to disappear in some instances. And this is actually the infinitive construct form for these words. For instance, for, for bow, the, the, the third masculine singular, this is the infinitive construct down here. A little sloppy, I know. Infinitive construct down here. The third masculine singular form is actually just ba. So it's only two consonants. But to help us in, in thinking about verbs, the, the Hebrew lexicons will use the infinitive construct form of the verb to give us that three consonant um, lexical form to, to look for when we're, when we're looking up a word. So that is, that is hollow verbs. Um, in the presence of a preformative, just some, just some basic rules of thumb to help you guys out as you work through some Hebrew um, hollow verbs. The, in the presence of a preformative, which a preformative goes at the beginning 
of a word, in the presence of a preformative, the, the holum or the shurek is generally going to remain in the cow perfect. So, go ahead and write, in the presence of a preformative, the long vowel stays. So, I'll give you one example of that. In the, in the cow perfect, or in the cow system, it's actually an imperfect, the word cum, I think we've mentioned this one once before, that's to, um, to rise up, to raise, to be high. Um, in, the, in the imperfect, which you know the imperfect preformative in the first person, common, singular, is the olive, generally with the segol, followed by a shurek under the first ground form consonant. Well, this is actually a comets. So this is uh, third, or I'm sorry, first, common singular, cal imperfect, and if it's and if the noun means I will or ought to be raised or to rise up, then we would translate this I because it's first common singular and it's imperfect, so it's will, I will raise up. So there's you one example of the consonant staying in the presence of a preformative, the preformative olive that's characteristic of the first person common singular in the imperfect. The vowel stays. Now, in the presence of an afformative that comes at the end, the vowel is often changed. So we're going to look at this same um, verb. We're going to change it up just a little bit. We're still going to use this verb, but it's going to be changed. We're going to do the second, because, because the imperfect system uses preformatives. You already know that. The perfect uses afformatives. It attaches something to the end. So, our verb... Cum, we're going to bring it down here and we're going to conjugate it in the uh, cow perfect. We're going to do the second feminine plural. What does that look like? Well, the shurek drops out. The mem changes form because it's no longer the final letter. And then we add our second feminine plural ending. So, ah, my er eraser keeps camping out over there. So, in the presence of an <coughs> afformative, the long vowel often changes. There you go. So, you have the lexical form is morphed when you add an afformative, the shurek is gone completely. You have a short vowel patak underneath the cough where there formerly was none. The mim is changed. And you recognize that's a second feminine plural ending. The second masculine plural is just like it. So, there you go. So if we want to do that in the perfect, we would render that um, at second masculine plural. So it would be you, y'all, y'all raise up. You know, we're talking about rednecks in their barns or whatever. So that is how you render a hollow verb in the presence of a preformative. It's most of the time going to stay. The presence of an afformative, the vowel often changes. So there's some, there's some uh, rules of thumb for you for hollow verbs. 
because we want to consider several different weak verbs today, we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, final hay verbs. These are all over the place. There are so many final hay verbs. And the hay is just really a weak consonant. He's always uh, absent from the party. So final hay verbs is where the hay appears in, as the third the, and final consonant of the ground form consonants. We have three ground form consonants for the lexical form of every verb. And hay appears at the end. And the hay is always dropping off, even in the presence of uh, afformatives, or especially in the presence of affirmatives, and uh, even in the presence of preformatives. So we'll look at a couple of examples of that. A final hay verb would be, how about this one? Asa. This is a good one to know. It's to do or make. This one appears all the time in Old Testament. To do or to make, asa. And that was another interesting one because you have guttural is the first ground form consonant, and you have another guttural, and it's a weak one, final hay verbs. Another one is Allah, similar to asa. And this one means, uh, you remember Bo meant to go or to come. This one means to go up. You've probably read Bibles where, and they went up to, well, that's probably the verb hanging out behind that translation, to go up, Allah. And then you have Baka, not Becca, but Baka means to weep. You notice how with, with the guttural there, the middle vowel is actually a comet in all these instances, not a patak. And this one means to weep. So there's some examples of final hay verbs. Now, we're going to conjugate um, baka. Look at some examples of that. You also have I'm going to go ahead and put this one up here because we're going to use it in a minute. You'll have already seen this one before. And this one is oh so common and very interesting because it's one that's actually got three weak consonants in it. So, woohoo for that one. This one means to be or become. So, when it's, ta- it's, it's talking about the state of reality. And it was, will be the rendering of that verb oftentimes. And it, and it came to pass, as some translations like to say. But there are some final hay verbs. We're going to look at uh, the final two. And I'm sorry, Mommy? Oh, chaya is the Hebrew pronunciation of that one. So, just a good rule of thumb for final hay verbs. Again, I, I refer you to the, the paradigms beginning on page 154 in the Van Pelt uh, compact guide. And for the, for the full paradigm, we're just going to consider a few examples. The hay is often replaced with a yud in the presence of an affirmative. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. And we'll look at an example. The hay will often be replaced with a yud in the presence of an affirmative. And remember, an affirmative one that goes on the end of a word. Pretty formative goes to the beginning. So let's look at baka. All right, so we had baka up here. Let's render it, 
Look, we need an informative. So which is going to have informative? Perfects or imperfects? Perfects. Perfects are going to have affirmatives. Imperfects have preformatives. So let's render this in the first person common singular. Let's throw the first person common singular. I'm going to win this eraser game by putting an eraser on both sides. We're going to have um, the first person common singular affirmative. So we would rent, we would start with And then we go in and we fill in all the Bakiti, I weep. My, take out the yud, you got all bagatka fat letters there. Pretty interesting. But you see the the hay replaced by the yud. And you can go into de- long and detailed explanations of how the yud and the he- and the hay were interchangeable in, in Hebrew antiquity and, and stuff, very technical, dry reading, some tough sledding if you feel like it. But for our purposes, we're just going to be aware of the fact that the hay is often replaced with the yud. So just be aware of that. So when you're, when you're parsing a verb like this, you're thinking, okay, what are the ground form consonants? It definitely looks like a first person common singular perfect. So we can take off the tet, or I'm sorry, the Tav and the, and the final Yud, well, that leaves me with a uh, Bet, a Kof, and a Yud. Well, if you look up Bet, Kof, and Yud, it's not going to be a verb, but if you remember, have on, as a rule of thumb, that the hay, the final hay, can be replaced with the Yud, that's going to tip you off, oh, maybe it's Baka. So look that one up. So just be aware, if you see a, an affirmative, the perfect affirmative, just take that off, count your consonants, and then replace, if you have to, if the final one's a yud, replace with the hay, look that up. That's just a good rule of thumb for a final hay verb. So, not always is this the case, though. It's a, it's a good rule of thumb, but it's not always the case. Well, that's why I wrote, will often be. I can't even give you the percentage. But there's an affirmative, the third common plural... That was the first common singular, the third common plural. Anybody remember what the uh, affirmative is for the third common plural? One letter. Anybody got it? It's a shurek. A lone little shurek. So, baka, that's third masculine singular. There's third common plural. The hay is being the weak ver- uh, consonant that it is, dropped completely, and the shurek just stands in its place. And you don't need a comments underneath the cough. It's got a vowel. It's got that shurek now. So that's the third common plural of baka. So there's one where the yud, there's not a yud anywhere in it. So it's, it's, it's true oftentimes, but not always. Um... The, again, I refer you to the Van Pelt paradigms. That will help you uh, identify sometimes where it is, sometimes where it isn't. The third common plural is a vowel, too. The, the first common singular brought with it a consonant. So, to let you know, when the consonant started getting added on it from the first common plural affirmative, the, the hey, to let you know that it was absent, left a yud here, you just have a vowel affirmative, and that just pushed the hay as well as the comets completely out of the way. So final hay verbs are uh, interesting ones. You just want to be aware that hays are, they're, they're really weak. They're always dropping out. Look at one more example. The verb haya, because this one's so common. So I really want to give you guys... Um, one with this, and this one in the third masculine singular imperfect is changed up quite a bit. So the imperfect gives us the yud preformative, right? So we have in the third masculine, you have the yud preformative, 
And it often appears this way. You have obviously a third masculine singular imperfect, the yud, and then you have shiva, and then the comets are gone. You have a segol standing there. That means, and it will be, and he will be, is how you'd render that one. But let's say, so this is third mass, let's see your cal imperfect. That's not the only way it appears though. It also appears this way sometimes. If you, if you look at your holiday lexicon, there's another way it can appear. So you've got one hay, whereas before you had two dropped off. The Shiva and the Hirik have changed roles. That means the same thing, and it will be. So these are both third masculine, singular, imperfect forms. And no, it's not nerdy to sit down with your lexicon and look at the forms. I mean, I like, I like thumbing through dictionaries, lexicons, just build your vocabulary, you learn stuff. People that uh, build these gas pumps now think that's pretty cool too. They give you a little word of the day now, some of these ones that I've got the screen, they come up with some really interesting words. Um, building vocabulary is, is, is not, not a waste of time in my opinion. But there you go, looking at some uh, lexical forms of that one. This one is one of the most inflected forms, probably along with natan, one of the most highly inflected verbs. So it's good just to take your holiday, take two pages, just look at some forms. There's not, it's not overwhelming. Um, there's quite a bit that goes on with that. So just being aware of how it can appear, then when you see it on the page, it's just a matter of, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's a form of uh, hayah. So those are uh, hollow verbs and final hay verbs. Now we're going to move on to initial yud verbs. We'll see how much we can get, get done. We still want to consider initial yud verbs and initial nun verbs. So we have initial yud verbs, which means the yud is in the first place of a ground form consonant. Now let's look at some examples of that. Get my notebook. Got some examples here for you. You have yalad. I think we've had this one before. That means to bear or give birth. And yes, that is the third masculine singular of a verb that means to bear or give birth. Because you bear a lot of things, not just a child. You can bear a burden on your back, so on and so forth. So there is, a, there is masculine forms of this verb. That's not weird at all. Um, you, won't, you won't find it talking about a man giving birth, though, but just want to put that out there. That's Yalad. And then you have Yarod. Now, we already saw um, the verb for to go up. That was Allah. This one is to go down. To go down. You got all these directional verbs in Hebrew, yarad. And then one final one, um, yada. And this one's an interesting one. And I'll go ahead and, uh, since we have a, a mature audience here today, so congratulations. This one means to know. And as you know in Scripture, to know, that oftentimes can carry sexual connotations. So this verb can be to know, it can be to have intellectual knowledge, it can also be to know one's partner sexually. Um, like the Sodomites, I had that on my mind for a while since when we talked about that tonight. You know, the Sodomites bring the men out, they tell a lot that we may know them, that carries with it sexual connotations. And this is the verb that's behind that. It, it, Adam knew Eve, his wife, she conceived, bore Cain a son. So you get the, the picture there. But there's some initial yud verbs. You have yud in the 
first position of all these ground forms. So, in, in the presence of a preformative, which goes at the beginning, of course, the yud drops off with uh, great frequency. So the yud is a weak consonant. Again, we're still talking about weak verbs. The yud is going to drop off with great frequency. He's always giving away his position to other uh, consonants. So, in the presence of a preformative, the yud drops off with great frequency. I'm just going to put great frequency because I don't have a percentage for you. There we go. All right. So the U drops off with great frequency. Let's look at some examples of this. It does maintain its position in the third masculine singular imperfect. There will still be a U there. Oftentimes there will be two U's. Sometimes there will be a U with a dogish. So you'll, you'll see the yud for the third masculine singular imperfect. But let's look at some other forms. Let's look at the uh, first common singular imperfect. Again, we're talking about preformatives. That's imperfect. The perfect has a formatives that go at the end. The imperfect has preformatives that go at the beginning. So we're still in the cal system. Let's look at a cal imperfect preformative. Let's do our old first common singular. That comes with an olive. Let's look at um, yalad. To bear or give birth. I will bear, I will give birth. The U drops off and you have a laid. A laid. This is the first common singular, Cal imperfect. So it means I will bear. And you have the yud nowhere in sight. And there's no, there's no dogish that lets you know it's gone. There couldn't be one in the aleph anyway. It's a guttural. It doesn't take a dogish. But you have two long vowels. You have the pair of tseres. And then you have your middle and final ground form consonant. So that's I will, give, I will bear, I will give birth. So that's one example. It also drops off in the first common plural. You have the nun performative in the first common and plural. It looks exactly the same with, the, with only one consonant swapped. You have nalaid. We will bear. We will give birth. Just uh, changes from singular to plural. So the yuds, they're always dropping off. You go from yalad to these things. So... Oftentimes, you, you might see that and go, oh, let's just look up the lexical forms. When you don't have A-class consonants, which is generally what most uh, Hebrew consonants ha- or Hebrew verbs have, you want to start thinking, okay, well, what, what might this be? You know, I see a nun, I see an olive. Those are the, the first-person performatives in the imperfect. So be thinking along those lines. And just be aware that yuds, at the beginning, drop out. Haze at the end, drop out. And I got another one for you. We will have all kind. Of, we have more dropouts than a, a high school in Alabama. But we have initial nun verbs. Initial nun verbs. The nun is also a weak consonant and drops out with great regularity too. And what's, what's somewhat frustrating about the nun dropping out is because there's so many verbs um, that, that have a nun as the first ground form consonant and a he as the final. I'll give you some uh, examples of these kind of quickly. You have, and these take various consonants, but you have not saw to be sprinkled. Um, you have 
Nata, which is to extend or stretch. And you have Naka to strike or hit. So you see that if, if you've got two consonants that can both drop out, that's yeesh, that may leave you only one ground form consonant with which to do your detective work and try to find out what verb you're dealing with here. And though these these were tricky, certainly were tricky for me. That's why I'm um I wanted to take the time to to be trained, experienced to mention these because weak verbs I like uniformity and consistency. I don't like it when stuff drops out. That was what gave me fits in Greek, the liquid futures that drop out all the time. So frustrating because you don't have any, uh, or you have less uh, to go with to try to find out what, what words you're even dealing with. It, it happens in English too. It's not unique to um, Greek or to, to Hebrew. To be free or innocent is this one. So there's you just a, a sample of, of verbs that have two weak consonants. And you have different uh, middle ground form consonants, but you all ha you have nuns at the beginning, hays at the end. And we're going to look at some examples of these where the nun drops off and the hay drops off. So this is especially common when you have um, preformatives. Sure. So, so when you have a preformative, that's going to affect the the nun. We're actually going to look at a hifil for for one of these. The hifil comes with its own preformative in the in its uh, verbal system. Um, it's got the, the hay with the heric and then also the, um, the, the usual uh, heric yud after the middle ground form consonant. But for these, when you come across these, these can be some of the ones, at least for me, that, that took the longest trying to find out because sometimes you think, okay, well, it's, it's, it's an initial yud verb. It's not an initial nun verb. And you go looking up, um, the ground form consonants you think you've got. Nope, maybe it's initial nun verb. So nuns and yuds at the beginning of a verb drop out all the time. Hays at the end drop out all the time. And then we're going to look at natan if we have the time, which drops a nun at the end. Got it, mommy? Okay. So we're going to look at one that's got a nun at the end that drops out regularly too. So, Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so, yes, actually. Yada, yada, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's not, no new information. I believe that is correct. I, I think I heard somebody, maybe in one of my Hebrew books, actually give that illustration. But yeah, yada, yada. So, um, good, good technical point there, Mr. Farrell. So, in an initial yud verb, we have... Um, we want to look at one hithil imperative and I know we've been looking at the cow but because these things do appear this is a form in holiday we have that that is, that is a hithil verb now you're thinking well there's, there's hardly anything going on there you have it looks like it could be a definite article we have there, there could be a second person uh, masculine singular pronominal suffix there. What is this? Well, you remember the, uh, the verb that we had over here? I'm going to write it backwards to make sure I have a space. We had naka, to strike or to hit. Well, here is the hifil imperative. Looks nothing like that. You have the hifil preformative here. 
you have only the cough remaining of the ground form consonants. That's a hyphil imperative. Go ahead and put that on the board. I keep saying it. Let me just go ahead and write it down. Hyphil imperative. And it means strike, hit. Somebody's given the command. You know, the hyphil is the causative sense. You know, cause them to be struck, cause them to be hit. Somebody's given the command for them to be, or given the command to strike someone, to hit someone, or hit something. So these forms do appear. That can be very confusing. I wish I could give you all of the forms where there's potential confusion, say, hey, this is something you want to be aware of, but they can appear sometimes highly inflected in the different verbal uh, systems. Let's look at a hyphil imperfect. Well, look, we had a naka. I may have just erased that. Sometimes I'm counterproductive frequently. So we have that. That is actually um, third masculine singular hyphil imperfect. He will cause striking or hitting. So there's that form for you. And see, you, you see, you've lost the nun, and there's actually a dogish in the cough that's letting you know, hey, something's dropped out here. When you have um, nun, uh, dogish is in the middle, typically could mean maybe PL, you know, got maybe, maybe that. The verbs don't, don't add up. There's not a heric underneath the yud, so there's a dogish here. Maybe something's dropped out. That's just another form that, that's highly inflected. And then let's go to the cow system. Let's go back to the cow for just a second. We had the verb nata, put the tet in the middle now, which we saw meant to extend or to stretch. And then you have a third Masculine, singular, cow, imperfect. For that one, that's just yate. Yate. Yate dinner yet? Sounds like, you know, redneck term. But that's lost two of its consonants. And that's a third masculine, singular, cow, imperfect. So you see, even in the cow, which we don't think of as being too, too tough when it comes to inflected verbs, you still have some that, that undergo a high level of inflection. And you might look at that and think, okay, it's an initial, it's initial yud verb. You've got at least two ground form consonants. No, you really just have one. You just have the tet. The nun and the hay are gone. Well, if it's third mask and senior cal and perfect, that would be he will stretch or he will extend. We would supply the will with the imperfect. And the third masculine singular would be he so that's, that's how we would translate that one. And then next week we're going to consider natan, which is another initial nun verb. means to give. So it's a very common one in the Old Testament. And this one can lose both of its nuns, both the um, beginning ground form consonant as well as the final and you end up with a lot of really strange forms. And, that, and Natan's a key, a key verb to be aware of because it, it appears almost 2,000 times in the Old Testament. So a very, um, very important one. And we'll, we'll pick that one up. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do it now. just want to have you look at two forms. This is actually... The cow infinitive form of Natan. Cow infinitive. So if it's the infinitive, it's going to be translated with a two, the preposition um, two. That would be to give. It's an infinitive. It's not designating how long or how much was given. But that one, as you see, loses both of the 
um, nouns. Now, let's do one with uh, a pronominal suffix. We have the tavs with the dogish, and each one has a hearing. Tit, T. To give me. So you see, that's highly inflected from the lexical form natan. So that's one that's very, very good to take your holidays lexicon, look at the forms that he gives you. Those do appear in the Old Testament. Um, and be familiar with how that one is inflected because it is going to appear uh, with great regularity. So there's some, there's some tips for translating weak verbs. Um, they, can, they can seem uh, tricky because of the, the disappearance of some of the ground form consonants, but uh, if you look at the lexical forms, keep your paradigms handy. That, that should help you uh, navigate the weak verbs. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our Father and our God, we're grateful for uh, this time we've been able to consider uh, the Hebrew text. We pray that you would bless the service that is to follow. Pray that you be with Pastor Little, that you fill him with your spirit and with power. Bless the message he's prepared. I uh, pray that you would exalt your son in our midst. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.